Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Uh, we start another uh, video on five zero nine zero, and this is the second video to the one which I just uh, previously uploaded, November twenty one, paper two two, and this has section B and C in it. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Section B. Answer both questions in this section. Write your answers in the spaces provided. The diagram shows a cross section of an insect pollinated flower. So you see this, there's a drawing, you must look at it very carefully, what is P, what is Q and what is R. Then complete the table to show the name of structures P, Q and R and one function of each structure. And then look at the marks, it's for 6 marks. So be careful, so that means there's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 marks. So you have to know is what are the 6 marks for and how carefully you've got to write. Sometimes it's only one mark. If this was for 3 marks, then there would be one mark for this line, one mark for this line. The whole line had to be correct. This line, this line, all had to be correct. The name and the function. So then it would have been for three marks. But no, this is for six marks. So you know why they are giving you six marks. Now you can uh, understand why the P was anther, produces pollen. Q was the petal or the corolla. And it acts as a landing platform for the insects to come and sit there and uh, the R is the sepal or the calyx and this is of course for the protection of the flower in the bud stage and of course it forms a little bit of a support as well for the receptacle where all the other uh, are situated. Then describe the surface of the pollen grain from an insect pollinated flower and it's rough, it spikes or it's sticky because it sticks to the pollen grain. Uh, it's sticky because it sticks to the insect, sorry, not the pollen stick to the uh, insect to the hairy body of the insect. Please don't say furry body of the insect. Insect does not have fur. So some of you write that that's wrong. It's the hairy body of the insect. And explain how this feature is an advantage to the insect pollination naturally because it attaches to the insect. And you see there are two marks for this whole question. Uh, then coming to the part two, explain how a pollen grain uh, from a wind pollinated flower is adapted for pollination. Actually, a pollen which is going to be a wind pollinated flower is going to be carried by wind. So it's got to be small or it's got to be light in weight. It's going to be very tiny so that it will be easily carried by a wind. And then, of course, carried by wind or it is buoyant. Buoyant means the ability to uh, float or ability to be carried by air. So that is why, like, for instance, when you're learning how to swim, you wear that tube around you so that makes you buoyant and you don't, uh, you know, drown yourself. So buoyancy, this love, buoy this word buoyancy, you've got to understand and you've got to, if you don't understand it, put it in the Google search and figure it out what the word buoyancy means. Then question seven, Costa Rica is a small country that covers approximately 0.03% of the Earth's surface. Approximately 5% of the world's plant and animal species can be found in Costa Rica. The table shows the percentage of Costa Rica's land surface covered in forest at different times between 1940 and 2010. Now, whenever you're reading a table, look at it with a very, very clear uh, idea in mind. In 1940, it was 75, 72, then 53, then 31, then 26, then 21. And so it's all decreasing here. 75, 72, 53, 31, 26, 21. And of course, the difference is very variable. Sometimes it's 10 years, sometimes it's 11 years, and then it's on even more than that. 1961 and 77 is about 16 years, then 83, then another 7 years. So it's variable. So have a look at this as well. 4 years, then here 10 years, and then 3 years, and then 5, and then 10 years. And then you see after this, it has started to increase 42, 47, 51, 53. So here it is increasing and here it is decreasing. So always look at these very, very carefully and see what is the trend. Are they increasing or is there one reading which sort of doesn't go with the trend? So they're looking that can you pick up those trends? If you can, well, you're a smart kid. If you're not, well, sorry, it's not your day. Describe with reference to data in the table how the percentage of forest cover changed between 1940 and 210. This is we're talking of 1940 and 210, 2010, sorry. So 1940, 50, 61, 77, 83, 87, 97, 2000, 2005, and 2010. So describe with reference to the data. So there's nothing which you have to do. Describe, I always say, is no biology. You just give to give me points from the table. So 
basically you only had to say is describe from 75 to 21 so this is the 75 and this is the 21 until 1987 from 1940 to 1987 and then increase from 21 to 53 from 1987 till 2010 so this is all what you have to give me nothing not no information which you had to sort of you had to learn of some biology or something it's no biology actually then the B part of the question says, explain the possible negative effects of the change in forest cover between 1940 and 1987. So if you look at 1940 to 1987, what is happening? The percentage of forest cover is decreasing from 75, it has gone down to 21. If you look at it, I mean, what are they asking you? They're asking you all the effects of deforestation because what is happening? The change in the forest cover is, is forests are decreasing. So forest decreasing means fewer root soils, uh, roots which hold the soil together. So this is going to result in soil erosion. Then rise in the sea levels and going to be flooding because all this soil is going to be washed into the sea. Then less photosynthesis, then less carbon dioxide absorbed. Of course, that means the greenhouse effect. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. This is going to result in global warming. Then trees are a habitat for many birds and insects. So there's going to be habitat loss then there's going to be an uh, impact on the food chain because if the birds die, then the food chains are disrupted, insects die, food chains are disrupted, reduced number of species, or you can say reduced biodiversity. And of course, it's going to result in uh, jobs and the economy if people used to visit that forest and there's tourism was being uh, promoted, then they're going to lose those jobs. Hotels are going to lose their uh, clients. Uh, tourists, tourist uh, guides, everything is going to lose their jobs if there are now, now not going to be any more people visiting this uh, area. Now, looking at the mark scheme again, I've just written it all down so that you all can know the exact wordings that I want you to use. So you could have said results in soil erosion, there's going to be increase in the sea levels which results in flooding, then there's going to be no trees, so no photosynthesis or less photosynthesis, then less carbon dioxide absorbed, then of course carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, then all this is increasing, so this is going to result in global warming. And because trees are um, trees are uh, a habitat for so many birds and insects, so there's going to be habitat loss. Then the food chains are going to be disturbed because if there are no plants, then there are no primary consumers, then no primary consumers, no secondary consumers. And this is going to result in reduced biodiversity. And of course, it's going to affect jobs and the economy of that place. Now coming to part C, suggest reasons for the change in forest cover between 87 and 2010. Okay, what has happened in 87 to 2010? Now look here, what has happened? From 21, it has gone to 53. So what has happened is there's going to be increase in the number of uh, forest cover. So the percentage forest cover has increased. So if it has increased, then what could be the reasons for that increase? Now the increase is conservation. Or what is happening is people are planting trees. So conservation, one mark. Then, uh, or you can say less deforestation, or you can say planting trees, people are planting trees. So this is now a very good thing because it's increasing. Then there is some policy or there is some legislation or there's some law which has been passed that for every tree cut down, you have to plant two more. Or there is education and awareness. So education and awareness will of course lead to people being more thoughtful and not cutting down trees and of course it could be maybe encourage tourism. So any of these points and you got your three out of three and that finishes your section B. Now in section C as you all know it's either question eight or question nine but whatever the number of the question is can be different in every paper and write your answer in the spaces provided. So now, of course, they've given you an option. Which one do you want to do? So you first, you read both the question and then decide which one you're going to do. Now, the question eight is define the term drug. That's for three marks. Describe the possible effects of abuse of a named drug. So any you could come up with, and that is another seven marks. So question eight, then question nine was outline the importance of a seed being provided with a good supply of oxygen. And the B part says, and this is three marks, and outline the importance of plant being provided with a good supply of water. So the importance, it both is importance. And then this, of course, the water part is for seven marks. So please decide which one you're going to do. Are you going to do eight or are you going to do nine? This is your decision. You must go over it. You must write down the points. 
briefly and say, okay, do I have so many points for this question or do I have uh, that many points for that question? And then make your decision and then start doing the question. Now in this question, define the term drug. Now this is actually the same definition which is in the syllabus. Externally administered chemical substance modifies or affects chemical reactions in the body. So it's actually the, if you, if you know the syllabus, you must realize the syllabus is a very good way of remembering every stuff because whenever we make a question, we have to specify which part of the syllabus are we examining. So define the term drug. Externally administered chemical substance modifies chemical reactions in the body. Same mark scheme points as the syllabus. Now just a brief revision of this, I want to talk about externally administered means what? When insulin is produced by the body, it's not a drug. But if you get an injection of insulin, it's externally administered. So a chemical substance modifies chemical reactions in the body. So externally administered could be an injection, could be a tablet, could be a syrup, could be intramuscular, could be intravenous, could be a skin patch, could be eye drops, could be an inhaler. So externally administered then it's a chemical or a substance. You could have said that the words which are allowed and of course it will modify. Like for instance, you have a headache. So you take Panadol. When you take Panadol, it somehow stops the headache. So what has it done? It's actually sort of uh, stopped some uh, nerve impulses reaching that area from where those that pain was generated. So you've actually just done something to modify the chemical reactions in the body. Then it says describe the possible effects of a named drug. Now here you have many choices. You could have taken any uh, drug and you should have talked about it. So you could talk about heroin. So reason for taking it is because it's highly addictive. It's highly euphoric. Then increased dosage for the same effect. When you take it initially, you have it small, a small dose of the drug is going to make you feel very good. But as you get addicted, now you need more of it to have the same effect. So that is called tolerance. Then it results in addiction. Then if you don't get the drug, you have withdrawal symptoms. And then because if you're talking of heroin, then we're going to talk of criminal activities because you're going to need money for the drug. So you'll, you'll steal, you'll uh, maybe do other things which will get you more money so that you can get the drugs. Or if you're talking of alcohol, then that's going to cause drink driving. Then uh, you would have to, uh, funding this habitat is going to result in financial implications. So you're going to be out of a job and then you have to get money for your addiction. Then social effects, I mean, maybe you have a lot of family issues, maybe divorce, uh, losing your job, and then socially people are not accepted. And then of course, health of the addict, like for instance, heroin uh, is going to cause its own problems and alcohol is going to cause cirrhosis of the liver. The long-term effects is cirrhosis of the liver. So there were many points and you could have easily got your seven out of seven if you gave me all those points. As you can see, it described the possible effects of abuse of a named drug. So the named drug can be either heroin or alcohol. These are the two in your syllabus. Now, the reason for taking it, naturally, it's a feeling of euphoria, which makes you feel so good, so people get addicted to it. And of course, some of you have to do it. Alcohol is more for the social uh, climbers. Then tolerance means increased dosage of the same, to produce the same effect, then addiction and dependence, then withdrawal symptoms, then criminal activities to get money to uh, fund the drug habits, or uh, if you're taking alcohol, then drink driving. Accidents can result in a uh, lot of human lives uh, affected. Uh, then funding the habit, so you need money for it, so you're going to do anything to get money. Then social effects is going to result in family breakdown or uh, social uh, acceptability. You know, people uh, will not accept such people. So uh, then cirrhosis of the liver is a long-term effect of alcohol and sniffing uh, affects the damages the nasal mucosa. So it damages the nasal mucosa and that is of course in heroin because the heroin can either be smoked, injected or sniffed, S-I-S. So all those effects of heroin. Then question nine, I mean, it's your choice, whichever one you find easy. Importance of seed being, pro being provided with a good supply of oxygen. Now, of course, naturally oxygen is only needed for one thing and that is aerobic respiration. So aerobic respiration is going to get you one mark. If you said respiration, I'm sorry, that's not going to get you any marks. 
So aerobic respiration, then what is aerobic respiration going to do? It is going to release energy, energy released, right? And then, of course, we're going to need energy for germination. Why? Because in germination, what happens? There is growth of the radical and the plumule. So growth of radical, if you mentioned that, radical, or if you mentioned plumule, I would of course say both radical and plumule. So growth of the radical and plumule. So there's a very narrow mark scheme because if you look at it, there are three marks and there are only three mark scheme points and you have to give me all these three to get your three out of three, which some of you do get it. I usually check papers and I find many of you do get those three marks. Uh, outline the importance of a plant being provided with a good supply of water. Now, of course, uh, water is what? It has to be a water potential gradient. So water enters by osmosis. So water potential gradient. If there's more water in the soil, then of course water is going to enter by osmosis. So water potential gradient number one mark, then intake by osmosis. Water intake by osmosis, you got another mark for that. And then of course uh, the root hair the root here is the point where this water is going to enter. Then if you said turgor, which results in turgor pressure, the cells are all going to have turgor pressure. Then of course it prevents wilting. So prevents wilting. Naturally, if the soil water is zero, then of course it's going to start wilt. Then uh, water is used in photosynthesis. You know, carbon dioxide plus water gives you glucose plus oxygen. So water is very important component for the process of photosynthesis. And then of course, transpiration. So the fact that water, uh, water vapors are lost from the aerial parts of the leaf and that results in a transpiration pull and the water is going to sucked up uh, in the, it's going to be sucked up in the stem in the xylem vessels and that's going to cause a suction force which is going to pull up the water in the xylem in the stem then of course this has also a cooling effect because the cooling effect is because of the water evaporating from the surface of the spongy mesophyll cells into the air spaces so cooling effect then water is a very good solvent and we've got everything dissolved in it like in the in the xylem we have got ions dissolved in it uh, and in the phloem we have sucrose dissolved in it so it's a very good solvent for transporting ions and sucrose ions in the xylem and sucrose in the phloem so it's a very good solvent then next point is sucrose amino acids in the phloem and amino acids. So you could have said any of them and you got a mark for that. If I put a slash, it means either you wrote this or you wrote this. So in the phloem, you got a mark for that. And then of course, mineral ions in the xylem. You could have also uh, named a mineral ion. You could have said phosphate. Uh, you could have said nitrates. Now, you know nitrates are needed for proteins. You could have said phosphate. Phosphates are needed for DNA. Or you could have said magnesium. Magnesium is needed for the chlorophyll, which is found inside the chloroplast. Uh, just like in humans, we have iron for hemoglobin. Don't say iron for red blood cells. So you could have said any of these named ions. Now, that, of course, finishes um, the section B and the section C. And I hope this has been helpful to you. And uh, thank you very much for watching and uh, thank you for subscribing to my channel and wish you all the very best. Thank you very much once again.